This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell about another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective Sherlock Holmes. I suppose your dinner is well over by now, so now's the perfect time to get out a bottle of that swell Petri California port. You know, Petri port was just made for a time like this, after dinner when you're just taking things easy. If you've ever tasted Petri port, you know what I mean. It's a hearty, full-bodied wine with a deep red color and a flavor that's just about out of this world. I think that if you had only one wine to choose and the whole world to choose from, chances are you'd pick port. Petri port. That's how good I think it is. That's saying plenty, I know, but I think Petri port will easily live up to all I say about it. Try it and see. And share it with your friends. You can serve Petri port proudly because the name Petri is the proudest name in the history of American wines. And now, let's visit our old friend, Dr. Watson. Well, I'm up here on the patio, Mr. Foreman. Come on out and, and join me. Admiring the sunset, eh, Doctor? Yes, my boy. It's a particularly beautiful one. Well, where are the puppies this evening? Uh, asleep on a, a favorite tweed coat of mine that's just come back from the cleaner. <laughs> and you hadn't the heart to move them, I suppose. No, no, I hadn't. The little fellows looked so comfortable. In fact, I sometimes wonder if these... Uh, but you haven't come here to listen to a dissertation on the behavior of dogs? Well, it is getting near story time, Doctor. Yes, of course it is. Well, just let me... Uh, Get my pipe properly lighted. Ah, that's it. The story I'm going to tell you tonight began in 1909. I received a telegram from my old friend telling me that he was leaving his Sussex bee farm and coming to London for a few days. I hadn't seen the great man for several months, so naturally I went to Victoria Station to meet him. As the train drew to a stop, the door of a first-class carriage swung open and Sherlock Holmes... Hand outstretched, jumped down onto the platform to greet me. Watson, my dear fellow, how are you? Oh, Holmes, my dear fellow, it's good to see you again. I've missed you. And are you, old chap? Harry Bates, sir? Uh, yes, Porter, and get us a handsome cab, will you? Right, you all, Governor. I wish I'd got a spare room for you. Don't worry, Watson, I shall be very comfortable at the Diogenes Club. By the way, I trust you're free this evening. Yes, naturally. What are your plans? I thought we'd go to the theater. The theater? Oh, what play do you want to see? Well, I thought we'd go to the Savoy Theater and see the Sherlock Holmes play. I hear it's enormously successful. Yes, I know it is, but I've avoided it. I'm told that Sir Claude Horton takes great liberties with your character, and as for the actor portraying me, my friends tell me it's a, it's a travesty. He makes me nothing but a uh, bumbling old fool. <laughs> Therefore, a visit to the play might be a salutary experience for both of us. In any case, my trip to London is a response to an urgent telegram from Sir Claude himself. Seems to need my help rather badly. Oh, what's his trouble? <clears throat> well, he wasn't specific in his telegram. He suggested, however, that we attend tonight's performance and discuss the matter with him afterwards. I see. Well, I, I suppose if you can sit through it, I can. Oh, of course you can, old fellow. In any case... You yourself are partly responsible for the play's existence. How do you mean, Holmes? <laughs> Those sensational stories you wrote of my modest problems, I I should have seen where they would eventually lead to. In time, no doubt, we shall uh, be portrayed on the cinematograph as well. Nonsense, Holmes. That newfangled thing's only a toy. I think not, Watson. We're on the edge of a strange new mechanical world. In fact, I begin to feel a certain concern about the rumored developments in wireless telegraphy. But enough of these predictions. Here comes our porter with a cab. We'll tell the driver to take us straight to the Savoy Theatre. Just look at that line of people at the box at the uh, box office home. Very flattering, old chap. Well, possibly, but I hope it doesn't mean that we've got to wait our turn and. Oh. Excuse me, gentlemen. You're Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, aren't you? Yes, yes, yes. I thought I couldn't be mistaken. 
My name is Frank Ferris. How do you do, Mr. Ferris? I'm glad to meet you, sir. Mr. Claude has a box reserved for you. He asked me to see that you are quite comfortable. Very considerate of him. Will you follow me, please? Thank you. Um, neither of you has seen the play before, I understand. Uh, no, Mr. Ferris, we haven't. <laughs> I imagine it'll be a strange experience seeing yourselves portrayed on the stage. By the way, uh, I'm playing the part of an old friend of yours, Professor Moriarty. Oh, oh indeed. <laughs> I'm looking forward to a very entertaining evening. I presume that you escape our clutches, as usual? <laughs> yes, I do, Mr. Holmes. <laughs> and I've done it nightly now for 137 performances. Oh, a record that I'm sure Professor, uh, Professor Moriarty himself would envy. Had it not been for his memorable demise at the Reichenbach Falls... Ah, here we are, gentlemen. This is the box reserved for you. And now, if you'll excuse me, I'll go back to my dressing room. Oh, oh, I nearly forgot, Mr. Holmes. Sir Claude asked me to give you this note. Thank you. Oh, not at all. Well, I'll see you later. Huh. Very nice fellow for an actor. Don't be a snob, Watson. Well, what does the Claude note say? I'll read it to you. Dear Holmes, since I telegraphed you yesterday, there have been strange developments. In fact, I've been doing some detective work off stage as well as on. Watch the performance tonight and watch the audience too, particularly the occupant of the box opposite yours. Please come to my dressing room as soon as the last curtain has fallen. Oh, he's being very mysterious and the box opposite ours is empty. No, no, no. Look, Watson, look. Someone has just entered. Confound it, the house lights are going out. The first act's beginning, Holmes. The first act, yes. Well, sit back and relax, old fellow. Let's see what they've done to us. Well, what did you think of the first act, Holmes? Huh? Oh, the first act, yes, yes. I was um, examining the occupant of the box opposite ours. An attractive young lady. Alone and unusually preoccupied in her program. In fact, one might assume that she was trying to hide her face. Yes, but the play, don't you think it's ridiculous? Just imagine a crown jewel being stolen from the Tower of London. Why not? It's been attempted many times. Anyhow, you must admit that the actor who's portraying me behaves like a, like a blithering idiot. <laughs> and Sir Claude's interpretation of you is uh, pretty far-fetched. Far-fetched, but flattering, Watson. What poise, what suavity, what a voice. I find myself thoroughly entertained. You're a strange chap, Holmes. No accounting for your tastes. Look, Watson, look. <laughs> the back of the box over there. Good Lord, I could have sworn a man dodged behind the curtains. I don't think the girl saw him, though. Looked like a foreigner. Huh. I think as the young lady's alone, we'll take the liberty of joining her. Oh, dash it, there go the lights again. The second act's starting now. And sit down, old fellow. We don't want to attract attention. We'll join her during the next intermission. <laughs> you want with me? Uh, my name is Sherlock Holmes, and this is my colleague, Dr. Watson. Well, how do you do, young lady? I hope you'll forgive this intrusion, but Sir Claude requested that I keep an eye on you during the play tonight. Please come in and sit down, won't you? Thank you. Oh, this is very kind of you. You must forgive my abruptness just now, but I've just been watching Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson being impersonated on the stage. It's, it's rather startling to have the real couple walk into my box. <laughs> yes, I quite understand. By the way, just before the curtain went up on the second act, I thought I noticed a man come into the back of this box and then disappear again. Were you aware of his presence? No. No, I didn't see him. But I know who it is. He's been following me for weeks now. Perhaps you'd like to tell us about it, Miss... Uh... Miss Henshaw. Alicia Henshaw. Yes, I would. As a matter of fact, that's why I'm here tonight. Sir Claude Horton's an old friend of my father's. I went to ask his advice. He did some investigating himself for a few days, and then he found himself a little out of his depth, so he decided to telegraph for you, Mr. Holmes. We were going to meet in his dressing room after the performance tonight. Splendid, and now, Miss Henshaw, what is your story? It's a strange one, Mr. Holmes, though I didn't realize just how strange until I first saw this play a few nights ago. You see, my story concerns a stolen ruby. Good Lord, and tonight's play revolves around the same thing. Exactly. I might as well tell you how it all started. My brother is an officer in the British Army stationed in Egypt. Early this year, he saved the life of a very important native personage in some uprising in Cairo and was rewarded with a magnificent ruby. This jewel he sent to my Uncle Timothy and me. 
We're the last of the Henshaws, you see. Did your brother tell you the name of this personage? He didn't know it, Mr. Holmes. Apparently, the whole affair was hushed up. I see. Please continue. Well, the trouble began shortly after Uncle Timothy and I received the ruby. A description of it was published in the papers, and a few days later, a message came to us from an Egyptian, Muhammad Ali, laying claim to the stone as one stolen from his family years ago. He sent an expert to our house who examined the ruby under a lens, Mr. Holmes, and then tapped it with a hammer. It fell to pieces. It was a fraud. Gracious me, an amazing thing. I'm sure that's not the end of the story, Miss Henshaw. Oh, no, Mr. Holmes. I wrote and told my brother what had happened. He became very suspicious and suggested that I investigate the credentials of the expert that examined the stone. I think I can finish the story for you. The supposed expert was a jewel thief who substituted a paste ruby for the real one. Destroyed the imitation and walked off with the treasure. It's an old trick. Of course, you haven't been able to find any trace of the supposed expert. Well, that's the funny part of it, Mr. Holmes. Uncle Timothy and I gave a description to the police, but oh, it was a very vague one, I'm afraid. All the time, Uncle said the man reminded him of a colleague of his many years ago at the university, a professor of mathematics. He couldn't think of his name, but when we first saw the play a few nights ago, he was reminded of it. The name was Moriarty. Moriarty? But Moriarty's dead. Miss Henshaw, you say you uh, have been shadowed for some weeks. Yes, by an Egyptian. They've stolen the ruby, Mr. Holmes. Why don't they leave me alone? That, Miss Henshaw, represents a, a very fascinating problem and one that I shall be most happy to help you solve. Oh, thank you so much, Mr. Holmes. Oh, there go the lights again. The last act. Yes, the last act of this little play, but not, I fear, of Miss Henshaw's problems. Uh, let's meet after the act in Sir Claude's dressing room, shall we? <laughs> Well, Holmes, how did you enjoy the play? Very much, Sir Claude. May I introduce my old friend, Dr. Watson? How do you do, Sir Claude? How are you, Doctor? I see you've already made the acquaintance of Miss Hanshaw, and she, no doubt, has told you her troubles, eh? Yes, Sir Claude. And Mr. Holmes has promised to help me. Splendid. Uh, tell me, Watson, how did you like the play? It was uh, interesting, Sir Claude. Not quite accurate, of course. Well, you, you have to allow us a little dramatic license, you know. Uh, what did you think of Rodney, the man who was portraying you, Doctor? Well, since you mention it, I think the fellow needs to study diction. He, he mumbles so much, I couldn't understand a word he said. <laughs> oh, come now, old fellow. I, I think there are times when you're a little hard to understand yourself. Oh, rubbish. Sir Claude, I <laughs> hope you'll uh, meet us at the Diogenes Club, and then we can go out and have some supper. Excellent idea. I'll join you there after I've taken off my makeup. Splendid. I think I should be going home now, Sir Claude. I gave my address to Mr. Holmes so he knows where to get in touch with me. Very well, Miss Hanshaw, and don't worry. I shall give your problem my undivided attention. I'll take you to your cab, my dear. Oh, there's no need to, Sir Claude. Nonsense, I insist. Goodbye. I'll be back in a moment, gentlemen. Right, Miss Hanshaw. Oh, good night, good night. This is strange business, Holmes. What, what do you make of it all? Very little as yet, but it's a fascinating problem. Sir Claude really seems to uh, have identified himself with the character of Sherlock Holmes. He gave me the impression that he feels quite capable of, of solving the case by himself. Oh, hello. Claude hasn't left, has he? Oh, no, Mr. Fellows. He's coming back in a moment. Uh -huh. <clears throat> How do you like the play, gentlemen? Very much. Your own performance as Moriarty was most convincing. Yes, Thanks. yes, indeed, sir. Congratulations, congratulations. A couple of times there, I had a strange feeling that you, you really were Moriarty. Well, that's very flattering, Doctor. Oh, Hello. Well, it sounds as if there's some trouble at the stage door. Hey, excuse me. Come on, Watson, let's follow him. Right. Hello, it's Claude. He seems upset about something. Yes. What's happened, Sir Claude? Oh, there you are, Holmes. I, I just seen Miss Hanshaw off in her cab when a foreign-looking fellow came out of a doorway and got into another cab. I heard him tell the driver to follow her. I, I tried to stop him, but... He got away. Must be the same man that we saw in our box during the play. Mr. Uh, Claude, we have our address. I think we'll drive there at once and see that she's arrived safely. We'll join you later at the Diogenes Club. Well, Holmes, here we go. Off on another adventure? Yes, and one they may give us an opportunity of crossing swords with Moriarty once more. Oh, Moriarty's dead. He was killed when you and he fell over the precipice in 91. He was supposed to have been killed, just as I was, but his body was never found. It's impossible, or rather possible, that he returned to pour into the ears of Colonel Moran a story as unlikely 
And as true as the one I related to you on that April evening in 1894, one can never be sure of death, old chap, until one has touched the cold skin of a corpse. <laughs> Dr. Watson's story will continue in just a few seconds. Hardly time for me to tell you about a really great Petri wine. Petri California Muscatel. Did you ever walk through a vineyard early in the morning and pick a big, juicy Muscat grape right off the vine? Mm-mm. If you've ever done that, then you know what to expect when you taste Petri Muscatel. Petri Muscatel is the color of golden sunshine with a flavor to match. Serve Petri Muscatel after dinner some evening, or serve it any time friends drop in. It's a wonderful way to express your hospitality with a wonderful wine, a Petri wine. And now back to tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. The famous pair have become involved in a strange mystery concerning a stolen ruby, a frightened girl, and an Egyptian who appears to be shadowing her. As we rejoin our story, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson are standing in a darkened alleyway adjoining the girl's house. Holmes, Holmes, look, look, look. That Egyptian fellow. He's pacing up and down in front of our house. Yes, therefore, we may assume she's safely inside. Uh Uh-huh. Seems to be giving up. He's he's coming this way. Flatten yourself against the wall. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Who are you, please? We are friends of Miss Hanshaw, and we're very curious to know why you've been following her. I'm sorry that I cannot answer your question, sir. Now, look here, my man. You're talking to Mr. Sherlock Holmes. You are Mr. Sherlock Holmes? I'm greatly honored to meet you, sir. All my life I have known of you. All my life I have admired you. Then in that case, perhaps you'll answer my questions. Uh, Why have you been following Miss Hanshaw? Because it is my duty. What do you mean, your duty? Perhaps I should have said my destiny, Mr. Holmes. For two generations now, the family of Arabi, of which I am a humble member, have dedicated their lives to finding the stolen treasure of Ashut. What on earth all that got to do with Miss Hanshaw? Hmm? The treasure of Ashut is a giant ruby. It was stolen many years ago from the family of Muhammad Ali. A few months ago, Miss Hanshaw received a mysterious ruby. I have found out many things, Mr. Holmes. I have many sources of information. Then I must regard you in the light of a, a rival detective in this case. I heartily call myself a detective, Mr. Holmes. My life is dedicated to only one problem. Miss Hanshaw now says the jewel was stolen from her. I do not believe it. That is why I watch her. If I am wrong this time, and I do not think I am wrong, then my quest must go on. Always it will go on. Permit me to wish you the best of luck, sir. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. Good night, gentlemen. Oh, good night, good night. Sure, we shall meet again. Oh, why did you let him go, Holmes? Why not? He's frightening Miss Hanshaw. But not molesting her, old chap. In fact, it might be a good thing if someone is keeping an eye on her. In the meanwhile, Watson, let's see if we can find a cab and get back to the Diogenes Club. I don't want to keep Squad waiting. <laughs> Has the Claude Horton arrived yet? Yes, Mr. Holmes. He and another gentleman came in about five minutes ago. They went up to the library. The other gentleman has just left. I see. Thank you. This way, Watson. I'm sorry, Sir Claude. We've kept you waiting. We took a little longer, but... Sir Claude! Great heavens! What's the matter with him? Holmes! I... I... I found the answer. Too late. It's... No, 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 sir. Don't try and stand up. You're... You're ill. What are you trying to tell me? The ruby. The ruby. Moriarty. The answer... The answer's... In... The book. In... The book. Sir Claude! Holmes! He's been stabbed. He's dead. Just as he was trying to give me a message. He was muttering something about the ruby and Moriarty. And twice he said, it's in the book. Yes, there's a book still in his hand. It's a copy of the tales of Edgar Allan Poe. His thumb's marking a page. The story of the purloined letter. Thank you, Sir Claude. You delivered your message. Come on, Watson. If we want to catch a murderer and a thief, we must go back to the Savoy Theatre as quickly as we can. <laughs> Why 
Why do you suppose that Claude was murdered? Because I was too curious. I've been investigating the problem of the stolen ruby and I found out something. Something he promised to tell me at supper, you remember? And so he was killed by a man who came with him to the club tonight. Fortunately, he gave me a clue by indicating Poe's story of a purloined letter. But I still don't see that how that helps you. Well, it leads us to the ruby. The premise of Poe's story is that the most obvious hiding place is the safest. Now, what uh, physical object was most prominent on the stage in tonight's play? By Jove, uh, a ruby. Exactly. How better can you hide a stolen ruby than by exhibiting it night after night as a stolen ruby before the eyes of thousands? Well, you mean you expect to find it in the, in the property room backstage? Precisely. That and a murderer. Wait for us, Cabby. Come on, Watson. You have your revolver, old chap? Yeah, yes, I do. Well, keep it handy. Our uh, visit may not be unexpected. I'm locked. That's good. Come on. Look, Holmes. Look. The doorkeeper. He's slumped over his desk. Hmm. He's been given chloroform. We'll take the liberty of borrowing his lantern. Huh. It's an eerie atmosphere. About a dark and empty theater, isn't there, Holmes? Now, where would the stage properties be kept, I wonder? Hold the lantern a little higher, will you, old fellow? Yeah. That's it. Aha. Uh-huh. Look over there. A large cabinet. It's marked property department. And it's unlocked. Oh, this is frighteningly easy. Let's look out for a trap. Now, let's see. Look, look. There's a ruby lying on that press. Hold it up under the lantern, Watson. Exactly. It's as I thought. This is no paste stage property. It's a genuine ruby. In the light of this lantern, it's very hard to... Down, Watson, quick! He nearly got us. Smashed our lantern. Yes, he's got an air rifle, a powerful one, too, confound it. There's no flash to indicate where he's firing from. Of course, he's baited his trap so neatly that he knows exactly where we are. I'm going to take a shot at him. I can't see anything, but at least it'll let him know we're armed. Now, move your position quickly, Watson. Just missed me, Holmes. This is hopeless shooting in the dark. Yes. I've got to switch the stage lights on. Keep him occupied, old fellow, will you? While I try to find the light switches. I've got him. But he can still shoot, confound it. Yes, well, I found the light switch. Keep your eyes skinned, Watson. I'm turning it on. There he is, Holmes. Up in that box. Getting away. After him, Watson. We can jump over the footlights into the box. Ah! I'm afraid the bird has flown, Watson. I should have remembered that theater exit doors always open from the inside. No, no, he didn't get away, Holmes. Look on the floor there. It's that Egyptian fellow. I hope you haven't wounded him too badly, no, old chap. I don't chap. care if I have. He was trying to kill us. No, it's only a shoulder wound. He's fainted, infernal scoundrel. No, he's a very gallant man. Undoubtedly, he was trying to save us as you shot him just now. Holmes, what on earth are you talking about? Obviously, he's Moriarty. No, Watson. Moriarty just escaped through the door you heard clang a few moments ago. Then what's this man doing here? As a fellow detective, undoubtedly, he followed us. Perhaps he preceded us. When Moriarty started shooting, this man tried to capture him and got wounded by you for his pains. Then who is Moriarty? He must be someone connected with this theater. It's obvious. Moriarty is Moriarty. What? You mean Frank Ferrers, the fellow that played the part on the stage? Again, remember Poe's story of a purloined letter. But why didn't, didn't you recognize him? Oh, remember, I haven't seen him for 20 years, and you haven't forgotten his genius for disguise, have you? What incredible audacity. How better could Moriarty conceal himself than by announcing nightly to the theater-going public that he was Professor Moriarty? Then he killed Sir Claude. Of course he did. Sir Claude must have persuaded Moriarty to go to the club with him. Probably he hoped to expose him in front of me, but Moriarty found out that uh, Sir Claude knew too much. Yes. So he stabbed him. Rushed back here to bait his trap for us. Yes, 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 yes. But how did he know that we'd, uh, we'd walk into it? Well, he knew that if Sir Claude had guessed his secret, then I certainly would. And so he was waiting for us. Oh. Hello. He's coming too. How are you feeling, my man? The... The ruby. The ruby. Did you find the ruby? Yes. Here it is, sir. Tell me. Is it the ruby of Muhammad Ali? No. No. It is a fine stone, but it is not the one for which I have searched all my life. Uh, So my... 
endless quest must go on and on on. He's fainted again. Oh, poor devil. Fine mess. I made of this case, Watson. Oh, I don't know. You've recovered the ruby? Yes, look at it, old fellow. Before I turn it over to Miss Hanshaw, look at it well. Probably it's every facet stands for a bloody deed. It's a beautiful stone. And yet this lovely bauble has cost Sir Claude his life. And that devil, Moriarty, still goes free. But one day, Watson, and may the day come soon, I shall meet Moriarty again. And when that happens, and I finally bring him to justice, then and only then, can you write Finney to the character of Sherlock Holmes. Well, Doctor, that was kind of an exciting story. Tell me, did the Egyptian recover from his bullet wound? Yes, indeed he did, and rather quickly, too, Mr. Foreman. I felt very badly about shooting him, but of course, uh... I couldn't help it. Of course not. Uh, but you know, if I had to shoot someone accidentally, I, I wish it had been the, the actor who portrayed me on the stage. Wretched fellow mumble all over the place. <laughs> oh, don't worry about that. After all, you did recover the ruby. Yes, and a beautiful stone it was. The color of, uh, well, uh, the color of a fine glass of port. When the light shines through it. By a fine port, I take it you're talking about a Petri port? Is there any other kind? <laughs> well, all kidding aside, Doctor, Petri port, like all Petri wines, is good wine. And I can tell you why very simply. Petri took time to bring you good wine. You see, the Petri family has been making wine for a good many generations, since way back in the 1800s. And because the Petri business has always been family-owned, Everything the family has ever learned about the art of making wine, they've been able to hand down from father to son. From father to son. That adds up to a lot of skill and a lot of experience when it comes to turning plump, juice-filled California grapes into clear, fragrant, delicious wine. So when you want a wine for any occasion, obviously you can't go wrong with a Petri wine because Petri took time to bring you good wine. And now, Dr. Watson, what story do you have lined up for us next week? Oh, uh, now, let me see. Next week, Mr. Foreman, I'm going to tell you a most unusual adventure that occurred to Sherlock Holmes and me early in the last World War. It took place in Flanders and concerned a famous British general, uh, an actress, and a German firing squad. Boy, that sounds like a real thriller. Well, see you here next week. No, no, no. Uh, not here, Mr. Foreman, remember? Oh, of course. Next week, we're going to be at the Paramount Theater in Hollywood for the seventh war loan drive. That's quite right. Ladies and gentlemen, I can't invite you all to my home for one of our broadcasts, but we can get together next week at the Paramount Theater in Hollywood. You can get a free ticket for our broadcast by buying a war bond. And I sincerely hope that you will do this so that we can see you next week at this time. <laughs> Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is based on an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of the Second Stain. Mr. Rathbone appears to the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce to the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Oh, the Petri family took the time to bring you such good wine. So when you eat and when you cook, remember Petri wine. To make good food taste better, remember... Pet, Pet, Petri. Bill Foreman saying goodnight for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. <laughs>